OK, good morning. Uh, welcome everybody to IFB's webinar. Um, thank you for uh, registering and joining us this morning. Uh, what we're going to cover off today uh, is a pretty hot topic for just every business uh, right now in terms of hybrid working and what normal looks like moving forward from from this point forever from now, because we've, we've all been completely disruptive in, in how we work and how we live and really focusing on um, in a non-technical way what this means for your critical business data uh, across your organisation, regardless of what size you are. You are. Uh, what we're going to cover today, as I say, is going to be non-technical. Um, it's there to design. Uh, it's there and designed today to get you thinking about your approach in a hybrid working environment, about how you approach data and cyber security and data integrity and how you protect data. Uh, possibly in a completely different way as you were when everybody was in the office and maybe only some people were remote working or mobile working. So it's about the concerns and the attacks and the threats that are, that are out there. Uh, it's also about your usage uh, of data and the tools that you, you work into that sort of space as well. It's also working from home and what a home, a safe home environment might look like to a business. It might not be as safe. And the need for monitoring, testing and knowing is, is really a key part of that. And we're going to try and leave you with three things to think about um, at the end of the session. We're going to be 45 minutes maximum, uh, but at the end of the session, we're going to try and leave you with three things to take away. Uh, all three might not be relevant for you, but we hopefully at least one will be. And if you can use the Q&A session, uh, the, the Q&A facility um, on Teams as we go through this, uh, and then we'll try and catch up with questions as we go through the, the event today and hopefully cover off any questions that you've got. Stacey is going to be our moderator today, so she'll be posting, she'll be posting, um, she'll be posting uh, your questions as they come through. So feel free to ask a question at any point. So from our point of view as an organisation, uh, why are we running? Uh, why are we running an event like this? Um, and really, it's to share our learning. Um, we've been to a thousand and one webinars using Teams and Zoom over the last uh, 16, 18 months and longer, of course. Um, but it's, it's to share our learning that we've gained from our customers and our suppliers and our partners. But also we've done a lot of this ourselves. I think it's probably the first time in history that every business has been on the same ship heading in the same direction uh, and really without a compass a lot of the time. So we wanted to share our learning from our doing uh, and our experiences. It wouldn't be a webinar without a pitch for what we do. Uh, we are IFB. Uh, we are a connectivity, cloud security and telephony company. Uh, we do everything from full fibre through to mobile broadband. Uh, within our cloud stack, we do physical hosting as well as virtual hosting. Uh, and within our cloud stack, we also talk about data backup and protection and recovery. Security is a big theme for today, but it's a big theme for us and it has been for a long time. This is our 26 year in operation and it's everything from vulnerability scanning. So know what you've got, but also knowing how to correct that and fix that as you walk through it. And of course, we do devices and software that fit into that security stack as well. And then telephony, which has been probably the biggest in demand service uh, next to security over the last uh, year and a half, certainly from uh, moving from traditional phone systems on premise PBXs to more cloud based, flexible systems like Microsoft Teams that we're using today. And we are Aberdeen based. You can see from the green rockets that we're very much Scotland based, but we've got some great clients across the whole of the UK and internationally as well. Um, and we always have uh, right the way through that. Indicatively, oil and gas has been our core marketplace because of our geography, uh, but business services and professional services are a key part of what we do, as well as public sector. So from our, our side of things, uh, first up, we would like to talk about security concerns and what does the, the, the workspace look like now and into the future? So some, there's a lot of statistics uh, kicking around, around all these elements here, but Accenture are saying uh, off the back of one of their recent surveys that workers say that a hybrid model is much more optimal for them. And we all feel that. We all feel that we're probably lucky that we can work from home. We're able to work from home and it's quite a nice environment. So therefore, we do feel it's optimal as, as a workforce. But we've recently carried out two or three surveys ourselves for our customers and beyond. And about 50 percent of companies, that's the decision makers within companies, are saying they'll probably return to a hybrid model. It's about 50, 50 percent with 20 percent of our uh, of our decision makers within companies saying um, that a full return to the office is highly likely before now and quarter one next year, quarter one 2022. So the numbers sort of stack up evenly there that businesses are saying a full return to the office by sort of quarter, end of quarter one next year. 
Uh, and what does that really mean in terms of the workspace and how it looks? So there's lots of statistics around the productivity gains held by uh, home working um, and remote working the way that we're doing just now. But there's, there's a lot of concerns around the IT security risk that many IT security experts view in home working. Um, and it's that loss of data. And whether that loss of data is accidental, uh, it's accidental through a lack of education, or it's deliberate either through a disgruntled employee, uh, which you can never remove from that space, uh, but also uh, an agitator from externally or externally to your business. That loss of data while everybody is out of the office um, is the first time we've had to consider that on a real time basis. And what that means is a very high proportion, over three quarters of IT leaders and decision makers as part of an IBM survey have said that a data breach uh, and a compromise in data would be so much harder to manage while everybody is out of the office, while everybody is, is working remotely, or even a large percentage of the workforce is working remotely. It's going to be much more difficult and much more of an ordeal for organisations of all sizes to manage that if it were to happen or when it's going to happen um, as we're going through it. So how, has, how could hybrid uh, affect uh, how this happens? Well, in the last 12 months, there's been more data breaches for businesses and organisations than the last 15 years combined. And that's in the volume of end user devices and devices that have been compromised. That's more in the last 12 months than the last 15 years combined, which is a startling figure. But what that really tells you is that's a mix of poor security, um, poor policy and poor, poor, uh, poor protocol in that space. It's a change in tools being used because we've all rushed to Microsoft Teams where two years ago very few people were adopting Teams the way we are now uh, and without much training. We've all rushed to get this done. It's been forced upon us. We had very little business planning or strategy time to do anything around it. So therefore from that space we've really had to think about where we're at now and how we move forward from it and there's a lot of elastoplasts that have been applied uh, historically to this point as we've moved, moved through things. So that compromise there is, uh, is real evidence that it's a mixture of uh, poor policy and protocols, a rush to get things done and rushing in security is never a great thing without planning and thinking about the implications of it, but it's also uh, workers in isolation and not knowing what's coming or not sharing the way that they could within an office environment like I'm sitting in today. What this also means is that the threat actors know this. If we, usually if you know there's a compromise in your organisation, somebody out there who's a bad guy, who's lawless, knows there's a compromise in your organisation also. And that's a really important factor here. The, 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 the larger and the smaller actors within uh, compromise and exploits have been working really hard to take full advantage of home working. And we'll cover some of those points as we go through here. And, and, and as the points to access your business have grown exponentially, um, instead of having two or three offices, you've maybe got two or three hundred endpoints now, that increases the factor of where you're at and what you're doing in terms of what you need to protect. And the rise of potential human error within that whole space there, um, you can't blame the team, can you? Um, but really, that working environment where I'm picking my laptop up to go home, uh, I'm taking it back into the office, I'm stopping off somewhere because I've got all the tools that enable me to do this, it raises the possibility of just that human error, that human error of leaving a, a laptop or a device unlocked while you walk away from it at home, uh, leaving a device behind while you're in your commute or a public space. Uh, all of these things using public Wi-Fi, all these things become much more relevant because there's much more of it happening. There's a st statistic uh, quite a long time ago, um, just at the start of e-commerce, where somebody was quoted that credit card, card fraud online had increased by a thousand percent in the prevailing uh, 12 months. Um, but credit card usage online had increased by uh, 10,000 percent. So the use and familiarity in that place of being more uh, uh, commonly in that home working environment and that transit environment between the two locations makes the risk of human error. And it's just an error. Nobody plans to have an accident. It, it increases that opportunity for human error. While we were speaking about this, IBM statistics say that 46% uh, of employees uh, don't get any help with remote working expenses. And that includes training 
and especially, if, and not especially, sorry, but that includes training and also around cyber security. So while training has been very much, uh, certainly in the oil and gas environment, where health and safety training is, is drummed into everybody all the time, and, and rightly so, that training has maybe fallen to, by the wayside because those responsible are not getting that in-person training environment. They're, they're not getting that familiarity to understand what those training needs are on a regular basis, and certainly affecting smaller companies, way more than larger enterprises, but they're not, you know, they're, they're not adverse to this, uh, this problem as well. So training is a key part in terms of that human error. You, we will still get human error because we're all human, but the key part in that is maintaining your training as you go through it and ensuring that people hear the message and it, and it registers so you can take impactful act, action. The, the nodding head in a training environment means that somebody's perhaps heard your words, but actually are they able to carry out the actions that relate to that education part? And a large proportion of the customers that we surveyed as, as one of the surveys that we carried out uh, was a really important to start from there that the ad hoc chats that happen with uh, the team in the office here, uh, as we've got here at IFB today, and other areas that we work through, um, don't happen. That coffee, that water cooler or that coffee, uh, coffee cup chat doesn't happen. So when that emer uh, urgent email comes through from the CEO, to the head of finance saying, uh, please transfer $200,000 uh, to help me with this deal. That double check just becomes a little bit more difficult. Uh, the authentication, and, and we've all seen those really smart emails coming through now that look amazing, and that's evolved into WhatsApp and text messaging now, because those are very personal things. They happen on my mobile phone rather than my corporate laptop. So therefore, while I'm at home, I trust a text message coming in on my mobile phone, maybe from the boss or another member of the team that allows me to click and then be compromised. And whatever that compromise is, maybe me personally, but obviously within the business data as well. So it's really difficult. It's, it's become very difficult to reinforce the training plans that most organizations have had in place, certainly for cybersecurity. And it's that learning that we need to use now from the last 18 months how do you bring that back into your organization? And, and indeed, how do you uh, work with others to help you bring that back into your organization? Changes to uh, data usage you know, and consumption. Where's that file again? Uh, and we flippantly put this title in here because um, we know that the tools that we've adopted over the period of time mean that we've perhaps got three, you know, back to human error, lack of education, lack of training, just convenience because we've had to get things done. Uh, we've had to keep working as a business. Um, we've got four or five versions of that file, perhaps in two or three platforms, because while we're working on it just now, we'll stick it into Teams because it's easier to collaborate with, and then we'll maybe move it into SharePoint and uh, we can join all those up later, but we just need to get the thing going here. So that cloud adoption and digital adoption, forget about digital transformation, that's happened. It's about digital adoption now. has meant that staying in business for many during the pandemic, people adopting new forms of telephony and communications systems, cloud-based systems, cloud-based accountancy platforms, because you simply couldn't get into the office to use that infrastructure, has now meant that there's a lot of people on cloud and it, the cloud adoption and cloud adoption across SMEs and enterprises accelerated. So 87% of businesses have sped up the cloud adoption because of the pandemic. 75% of, of enterprise say that 90% of security and 90% of security experts say that cloud is now their top concern. So while we've all rushed to the cloud, and quite rightly so, you know, as, as Job said, software is going to eat the planet, and it is eating the planet. You're driven by software. You're, you're usually driven by software decisions when it comes to IT infrastructure. It's the best software for the business rather than the best server, the laptop or the, the hardware that's sitting in that environment. And you've got to go through that diligence. You've got to apply that diligence as you pick up a new license for a set of users within your organization. You've got to think about these things as you go through it. Is that as secure as it needs to be? Not as it could be, but as it needs to be for your business. And that's a big part of security that um, we sometimes get baffled or overwhelmed that it must be completely secure, which is just impossible. Anybody who tries to pitch you that uh, internally within your business or externally as a vendor, uh, you should just strike them off your vendor list because it's not possible to be 100% secure. You can be as secure as you can be given your environment and your business requirements. And it'd be interesting to hear from you if uh, anybody has any questions around that or, or, or points around that uh, security aspects about being as secure as you can be, please feel free to post it to to, to Stacey and, and Stacey will post it and publish it here so we can perhaps respond to that as well. 
But that high speed adoption of cloud uh, really quickly in massive volume uh, really has increased that level of uh, lack of confidence in cloud security and how you adopt it because it's new. It's net new for many businesses. Many businesses will take it for granted that I'm on the cloud with this application. Uh, so therefore it's being backed up. That's not simply true. That's simply just not true. It's not always just the default that's on the cloud and it'll be there forever. It's on the cloud and there'll be an SLA for its availability uh, and how long it's going to be backed up for. So it's those sort of changes that you need to think about as you go through. So that continuing a business because you needed to continue your business because the business needed to survive hasn't taken the processes and policies and procedures with it online out of the office remote working that it could have. Not, not in every instance, you know, there's some great business who've got some fantastic customers out there. They've got very robust cyber security processes and look after the data uh, really, really well in this environment and at least as good as it was uh, two, three years ago. So, but check, be understanding that you've got a new environment, you've created these new spaces to work in, you've created these new spaces for data to, to reside in. Are they as secure as your business needs them to be? So, um, What's that connected to the network? No one ever asked, especially at home. Um, there are very few of us um, that would know what's connected to your home network. Uh, but I think at last count, I probably had 37 or 38 devices connected to my home network. And that is everything from the obvious ones, um, such as computing equipment, and but right the way through to doorbells and uh, the skybox uh, and Alexa and smartwatches, all these things coming through that single device that single router, that single connection, that in re real terms, uh, even in a, in a privileged position such as I am with the team here looking after me so well, that home working is, is really about taking my work to home where I live with another four people, another four adults in a non-business environment. So I've got to fit into that environment and I can do it securely through multi-factor authentication and all the tools that sit around it, but I'm still sharing the network probably with a lot of devices or possibly with a lot of devices uh, that my team here don't know about and wouldn't allow on the network here in the office. So how do we overcome that? And it's really important that you understand what's on your network. That knowing part uh, from a security point of view or knowing as much as you, as you possibly can in a meaningful way is a really important factor that we're looking at here. So somewhere on your network, without a doubt, at home, there's going to be something that's out of the box that maybe doesn't have username and, and password as its uh, uh, admin and password or, or 1234 as its access devices, but it's maybe not configured the best way. It's maybe got something in there that's got an open port. It's maybe come out of the box from somewhere and it's plug and played and you have gone into the interface and I've changed your username and password. So yep, that's secure. But is it? Is it configured the way that a router would be de deployed in your business? And that might seem like overkill, but actually with a little tweak in there, you can make these things a lot more secure, not just for the business, but also for that homework and the family that, that, that resides there. But nine times out of 10, there'll be something kicking around that's connected to your network or trying to connect to your network that shouldn't be there that you don't know. So while that home space is a much more relaxed space, um, it shouldn't be relaxed about security when it comes to your business environment. It should be pretty important that you maintain those same levels or standards for the user and the user environment in that space as you do in the office space. Excuse me. Finally, Aberdeen Gin. So from, from that point of view, uh, that relaxed attitude to workspace doesn't really mix with cyber security because cyber security shouldn't be easy. Um, it should be straightforward and it should be enough, but it shouldn't be easy, but it shouldn't also restrict your business. Cyber security and security settings and work and policies and procedures should actually enable your business to be better at what it does, slicker at what it does uh, and um, more trustworthy internally and externally. So how can you be sure about that? How can you be sure what's on your network, what it's doing, why it's there? Um, should it be there? That points of access to your business because I'm at home is now giving me a whole heap of problems. Roughly, um, the points of access to your business digitally have probably multiplied by the number of staff you have minus the number of offices who are now working remotely, now minus the number of offices you had before. So if you've got one office and 100 staff, you've got 9900 people working from home, 
you've got uh, 99 of them are now access points back into your network. Those are your vulnerability points. Now, you may say that everybody in the office, one office, 100 people in it, there's 100 points of exploit within the building, but you're protecting that building, remember. So the simple number is how many people have you got working home, less the number of offices that you had before or have currently. That's the number of access points you've got into your business, roughly. That's the vulnerability points. That's what potential exploiters and attackers are looking for. They're looking for those endpoints. They're walking down the street and they're trying doors and cars and the windows. They're not really necessarily trying to break into a car. They're not really trying to smash the window in your office or your firewall, but they're just looking for those loose doors, those doors that have been forgotten about and left behind. And that's how that's going about. And you need to be sure that those doors are locked as best they can be, that you're looking after your teams and your data and your business as best you can be. Taking for granted that everything and everyone as is it was as good as it is or is as good as it was and is that way moving forward is not good enough. It shouldn't be difficult for you to do a vulnerability scan the same way as it shouldn't be that difficult for you to do a security sweep of your building, check your windows, check your doors, you know, check your alarms working, check your fire detectors are working. Doing an automated vulnerability scan on a regular basis helps you monitor and look for changes in your network and it's those changes you need to look for. Those changes are some brought, sometimes brought about by vendors um, uh, there's a Windows 10 update, so do I know that all the laptops have now been updated? Are you sure about that? Have you tested it? Because you don't want an explo a potentially exploited laptop coming back in and joining the VPN. So those sort of things, those changes in your network can occur through third parties and not just yourself, especially when you've got a supply chain that's a digitally enabled supply chain. Doing this continuously, or at least on a, a regular scheduled basis, is important. You do not get a six pack by going to the gym once. Uh, you get a six pack by going to the gym uh, because you care about getting a six pack. Uh, you're persistent uh, and you keep going. And security is exactly the same. You don't need to go and do it every day, but it'd be great if you could. It'd be great if you could have some real time monitoring within that environment that tells you what's happening, what's changed, why it's changed. But more importantly, if you can see it and measure it, you can manage it and, and improve it. And that's the key part for vulnerability scanning is having a meaningful report that sits in that environment that you can say, maybe not as a CTO or an IT manager or an infrastructure lead, but a report that the business, you know, the business, the decision makers within the business understand the vulnerability that's there and then can take the time and resources to invest cash money uh, or, or an investment to make in time. Uh, to make and improve those changes and, and, and remove those vulnerabilities. And then you do it again and again and again. And does it improve your business? Uh, sure, of course it does. You remove a vulnerability, of course it removes a, a vulnerability and you improves your business. But you need to maintain that just to stand still because the people that you're dealing with the majority of the time are, are lawless and they're persistent. And that's all they do. While I might be running a, a, a data and connectivity company here in Aberdeen with a team here and somebody across the road is running an oil and gas company, these perpetrators are all just running hacking businesses. Their full time occupation is to exploit vulnerabilities in cybersecurity and, and configurations and infrastructure. That's all they do. So they are full time in this and that's what makes it difficult. So we stomped on with time a little bit um, and hopefully we maybe have a, a couple of questions from the floor, but what do we want to leave you with? Um, it shouldn't it shouldn't be simple, but it shouldn't be overwhelming. You know, the, from a cybersecurity stance and point of view, it should be straightforward enough for you to understand what your environment looks like. Uh, you should be able to uh, scan uh, and speak to people and understand what your environment looks like, but probably and possibly uh, look at a third party to help you with that, to take that on board and say, well, somebody independently of here has uh, conducted a scan of our network internally and externally, and here's the green, amber, red. Here are the things that we need to pay attention to. Here are the risks. Here's the risk matrix that is coming about. This is what we need to do in this environment. This is how we need to play this. This is the investment we need to do. And if you don't do it, this is the risk to the business. So you can then prioritise how you act and how you move forward. And that's really what we want to leave you today with is thinking about the actions that you could take quite simply and quite easily and quite cost effectively. And I'm not comparing that against uh, the million dollar uh, uh, cost of a breach to most businesses. What I'm comparing that against is normal business operations. Cybersecurity should be a normal part of your KPI and reporting infrastructure 
uh, and process and regime within your organisation. And we found that the customers that we're working best with have adopted that approach to say, OK, let's do a discovery. Let's understand where we're at. Let's understand what we need to do and then how we need to do it. We are also a little bit like um, we, we've taken the decision as an organisation that we don't want to be the uh, driving examiner or the tester. Sorry, we want to be the driving instructor. And there's two clear things there. We, we want to help and maintain our customers, maintain a good security regime as best they can. But we don't want to be coming in and testing that. We don't want to be doing penetration testing. Uh, we don't want to be doing certification. We want to help our customers move toward that. And we want to be that that um, uh, we want to be there beside our customers as they go through that process on an ongoing basis. But we think it's really important that we separate ourselves from that test and penetration side of things, because it's, that's gamekeeper turn poacher in our book. To do both of those things equally well for a customer is really difficult to do um, uh, subjectively. So we want to take our customers, and we are taking our customers in that security journey, which sounds like cheesy marketing stuff, but it is. It's an ongoing process, and you never reach that, reach that destination because there's always something improved, new piece of technology or something changes within your environment. And that's our stance in it. So because of that, that's why we become uh, Cyber Essentials Plus certified for ourselves, because it's good for our business to do that. It gives ourselves confidence internally that we're doing what we need to do to keep the business secure on an ongoing basis. And we regularly test that on a, as our certification comes around on an annual basis. Uh, additionally, we're going through uh, additional certification and training as a team um, that allows us to come in with customers to help them get to Cyber Essentials Plus. And there are others, ISO 27001 is a key one, um, and, and a few other certi uh, security certifications around there. But as an entry point, try and achieve Cyber Essentials Plus. And our mood and our progress and our strategy is to help our customers achieve that, but not to certify them. That should be done by an independent person, independent entity from us, because then it means that we're honest and true and we're doing the best for our customers and we can continue working with them. Part of that is that communication and education with our teams. It's really, really critical. Um, a big initiative for us has been working with SBRC uh, and we've run a whole almost year now of exercise in a box which is designed really as anyone within your organisation can attend one of these exercise in the box seminars. I think the next one's in the 16th of, the, of this month, and then it moves uh, from virtual to in-person meetings later in uh, October, which we're very much looking forward to hosting here in Aberdeen. But the exercise in the box is designed to test everybody and improve everybody in your business, not just the IT discipline, is to get ambassadors for security and best practice right across the whole organisation. That's why we love it, because the majority of our customers are not IT companies. Uh, and the majority of our customers are absolutely they're IT experts when they're IT managers or CIOs and the companies that we're dealing with. But we want to help them help their organisation become more secure. And the more people they have that in that environment, the better. Be as certain as you can be about what you've got. Meaningful scanning, not a report that's 57 pages long that it takes you half a day to read because you won't read it. Have a report that has front and centre, five pages maximum, regardless how big your organisation is. Here's the stuff that you need to pay attention to and this is how you could fix it. These are the steps that you need to take in order to make yourself more secure. And that is really part of any business KPI. It's part of our board reporting and our senior management team reporting on a, rig, on a, a weekly and a monthly basis. It's a KPI. How secure are we? What's happened? What do we need to invest in to reduce those risks? And as I said, aim for that accreditation part. It brings confidence internally to your team. It upskills your team uh, because the process of certification, you know, you, you improves your business, it improves your thinking because it gets you out of, we've always done it this way, so if I tweak it a little bit, it will be better. Actually, this is the best way of doing it. And it moves you from a, a bump, fix, improve environment to an improve all the time environment. So you're, you're not dealing with things, you can deal with things uh, as they are broken, but you're not dealing with things as they break. You have a, a policy and a strategy that is about security first and cyber security built into everything you do, which is fundamentally uh, a basic for any business as we go through it. So a couple of links in there, uh, exercise in the box, if you want more information on that, uh, email the team, uh, we'll be in touch after the webinar. Uh, and let you know about the next events that are coming in. They've, they've been fabulous. The guys that have helped us from SBRC on those events are 
uh, fantastic. The, the, these guys are way out there as hackers. They, are, they, are, they understand that exploit environment way more than we ever do as, a, a, as an organization. And what they do is they help us educate ourselves and our customers, and they do it in a non-threatening way. There's a non-technical, they can be extremely technical when you need them to be, uh, but in a non-technical way, it's about best business practice. And obviously you've got guidelines in the SBRC uh, website there and the NCSC uh, government website as well, which gives you some really good cheat sheets, really good cheat sheets, um, uh, really good cheat sheets in terms of just business operations. So there's a couple of questions that come in um, that we'll just try and read because I don't have my glasses on, so I should better prepare for the next time. Uh, so uh, cyber security can be seen as a technically challenging su subject. How do you get by in at the board level to improve controls where there's not much understanding of this? Um, it's a really good question. Um, I think out of 740 customers, we are aware of less than 30 who have gone Cyber Essentials or Cyber Essentials Plus. We have a lot of customers in that space who are, and a lot, maybe another dozen or so, that are ISO 27001 accredited. Um, and traditionally, that's been the preserve of enterprise level. But it's a tiny percentage of our customer base. Uh, and it's from really big oil and gas multinationals right the way down to SMEs, uh, you know, 25, 50 employee SME, SMEs. And it's really difficult to get that board buy into investing in cybersecurity until you have a breach. And then everybody throws their hands up and, and says, um, uh, why were we not that secure? Why were we not ahead of the hackers? Why do we not have that exploit plugged? Um, and the balance that the customers we've, we're seeing taking it seriously is having a meaningful board report that says we've done a vulnerability scan and this is what it's telling us. And if we take if we don't take these actions, this application, this business service, these users might not be able to work for 24, 48, so indefinitely until we pay a ransom. And then that business risk stops becoming an IT risk and it starts becoming a business risk. So you're passing it back to the board. If, if you've got a chat, and we, we do this a lot with our customers that we come and speak to the board enablers. You know, we don't see them as blockers. We see them as enablers. If you can get somebody in the board who's saying we don't need to invest in cybersecurity, we're fine, which is the worst four letter F word out there, by the way, we're fine. Uh, what you can do is flip that around and get them on side. And if they understand what the risk is and they're signing off that document to say, I accept that risk, that changes the dynamic there. And it's that is not easy to do. That's a difficult thing to do. But we're here to help with that one. But that's how we usually approach it. Do you know what you've got, how you're set up just now? And that's usually the starting place for most organisations that we work with. And once you understand that, then you can report on the vulnerabilities and then you can show what the risk to the business of those vulnerabilities are. And if you equate it to um, you, you, or your uh, customer management system or your invoice control system has got a vulnerability in it because the box is a 2003 server or whatever it might be. And this is what it would cost to plug that hole. But if we could do without with that for 24 hours, that we've lost X amount of revenue or X amount of credibility. And you tie that into that business message as a, as a key one. So delighted to help with that. That's a, a, education right to board level is a big part of what we do. Um, we don't do the consultancy part, that's not where we're at as a business, but that advice part, absolutely to help any of our customers see what the risks are and establish how best to manage those. Um, uh, not a question as such, but more to say how impressed we are with IFB, blah, blah, blah. Thank you very much. The flyers in the post. Uh, here's a customer that's on here, should be name, uh, nameless and he's not one of my staff. Let me just quickly point that one out. They've used our vulnerability scanning tool uh, and we designed our vulnerability scanning tool because we felt that the tools that were available to us and we're pretty good at what we do. We're, we're, we're pretty expert at what we do. They were too complicated for my simple head. So I was seeing a vulnerability report coming from the team that I just didn't understand. And what we did as a team said, right, OK, how do we how do we package this together? And it perhaps ties into the, the, the previous comment. How do we put something together that is much more meaningful for a CEO who knows the business very well, but doesn't know the technology that well? How do we put that together and say red, amber, green, you know, one, two, three. The, but here are the risks. But this is why they're a risk. And these are the steps you need to take to reduce that risk. And that's how we viewed it as a, uh, that's how we move forward as an organization. Um, that we we are, our, sorry, excuse me, our vulnerability scanning, our vulnerability scanning tool was very much born of us needing something that qualified the business need. 
It was about getting my buy-in, uh, getting my buy-in to say, okay, well, that is a risk. We can't have that risk on the business. Or likewise to say, hey guys, I understand it's a risk, but right now it's a risk that we'll have to live with because it's not affordable or we're going through a change as part of a bigger project. It's about that calculated risk. And actually it shouldn't be calculated, it should be measured. It should be the cost of not doing this is this impact on the business. And if you can put numbers in those two things, it's amazing how you get the CEO or the head of finance or any of these people paying attention much, much more uh, and much more positively. So no more questions in the, in the slide, slide pack today. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us. You know, it's the first one we've done in a long time. Uh, your feedback would be great uh, in terms of uh, what you thought of the content. Nothing about the presenter, thank you, but the format and the content that we've gone here. Uh, the next exercise in the bot workshops that we're running, if you want to email the team, but the team will come back to you and there'll be something on our website in the next 24 hours about the, the next events that we're running with SBRC and Exercise in the Box. They are truly uh, amazing uh, events to be running for non-technical people. And that's, I feel sometimes our biggest challenge, a couple of points that we've seen in the questioning here, how do you get non-technical people or non-IT people to buy in that cybersecurity is worth investing in? Um, it's a little bit like insurance, unfortunately, but nobody goes around without building insurance or car insurance or fleet insurance. So therefore it needs to tie into that conversation and it's how we do that. It's how we, we, we help our customers make, make those decisions. All that's left for me is to say thank you very much for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed IFB's webinar on uh, hybrid working uh, and the risk about your data. There'll be another webinar uh, in a month's time on a different topic uh, and we hope you can join us for that as well. Thank you very much.